I am Larry Lala. Uh, I have been tutoring law students for the last 10 years. I've run an online course for the last five. I give in-person seminars and my focus is a little bit different. It's basically to be a coach to law students. Um, there's a lot that's I think broken about law school and I've written about this elsewhere and I won't belabor it here. But the entire game of law school is kind of a bait and switch. You spend most of the year reading piles of cases, and yet that isn't how you're graded. Uh, and so what I teach is getting people to avoid doing the kind of work that doesn't help and steering, steering them to practice the things that actually matter uh, to doing well in law school. So let me, um, I'm going to put up some slides. Uh, I'm going to hide behind them for a little bit. I will peek out. Every so often when I get questions, I want to do a short demo on the online course uh, uh, that I sell. And then I want to answer any questions that you all might have um, about law school, about life, about mustaches, um, anything that I can help with. Okay, so I'm gonna call this how to win at law school. Um, it's something uh, that I've done before for LSAT Unplugged students. And this is a presentation that's in several parts. I'm gonna start out with what's wrong with law school. Uh, just there is a dysfunction at its core, but without criticizing it, just describing it so that you know what it is that you're facing. Um, and then I want to identify what I think are the winning strategies in law school. I'll give you a short demo and then questions. Okay. How do I win at law school? Um, I think is the question that many of you are, are asking when, when you head off there. You've gone through, uh, uh, you've jumped through a bunch of hoops, uh, some with Steve in terms of trying to the LSAT so you get in the best law school possible and then um, write up the best application that you can. But once you're in, what is it that you do? Uh, it isn't uh, a golden ticket to, to Willy Wonka's factory. Uh, you still, uh, almost at every law school, maybe not Yale, but even there, probably so, you still need to work hard and do well to get the kind of job that you that that's having you headed to law school in the first place. I think there are three core enemies in law school, and you need to know them, and you need to understand them from the inside, not just kind of intellectually, but what it feels like, the kind of pressure that you will experience once you get there that will cause you to turn off your brain and kind of follow the herd and do the things that will not help you stand out. Uh, in terms of grades. Three main enemies, and then the reaction to these three things is kind of the fourth enemy that I didn't list here, but we'll talk about it. Enemy number one is giant piles of books. Enemy number two is other students. Enemy number three is professors. And I'm talking about these, not, not as the objects, but the kind of psychological or social pressure that they, they they impose on you um, and steer you to kind of act in panicked ways. Piles of books. So you already know um, that law school is a lot of reading. It's, there's no textbook. It's a reading of case books. So these are piles of actual books. Some of these are kind of 2L books, but even your 1L year, you will have stacks of books that look like this. And this is a first year assignment I pulled off the web from NYU Law School, it's property. Katrina Wyman, who's a great professor of environmental law mainly, uh, but she teaches property. And so you get a syllabus before you even start class and you're told to do reading before you start class and you'll be called on from minute one in class when you get there. So here, it's not a typical read, uh, pages one to 42, the case book and this article, please come prepared to discuss the material. Uh, this is not atypical. So let's do a little math because that's totally why you're headed to law school. 
42 pages is not atypical. Let's even say that it's less than that for, uh, in terms of the preparation that you'll engage in for a single class. So let's even say it's 25. You have three to four classes per semester. Let's just say that it's four. And you meet two to three times weekly, depending on the class and depending on the hours. So do this math, 25 pages times uh, four classes times uh, two and a half, let's, let's just average, uh, meetings per week means that you've got to read 250 pages a week. Um, for some, it may sound like a lot, especially if you weren't kind of in the humanities or social sciences. For those of you who were in the social sciences, maybe it's a little, maybe you had to read a giant book a week and you did way more than 250 pages. Uh, this is a different kind of reading. Um, what is at least in theory expected is a slow, careful, detailed reading of these cases. And some professors will urge you to keep reading these cases over and over again until you get them. That's enemy number one. This is enemy number two. Uh, other students, this is you too. Um, is some variant of basically you're going to school with Hermione. I always forget if it's Thelma or Velma and, uh, <laughs> and Brainy Smurf. Um, this is how, so let me go back just two seconds. This is how the reading load will feel. It will feel um, overwhelming and constant and oppressive. You are this student, but the kind of pressure that other students will bring is that they, they're all at your level. Um, they're all this kind of brainy with this kind of glasses. Um, they are actually like literally your peers based on the hierarchy of, of law school admissions. They're in the same GPA range, the same LSAT range, and you're the same. Um, you will also feel this sense um, that you don't belong or that you're not good enough or the other students will seem smart. Everyone I know, even kind of the people who end up graduating first in their class, end up with this feeling that they're actually Neville Longbottom and not Hermione. And I don't know why, but it looks like Hermione's kind of smirking uh, at Neville. So combine those two things, the giant reading load and your sense that you're intimidated by your peers with the professors. So this is, of course, Charles Kingsfield is played by John Houseman uh, in the law school movie, The Paper Chase. Actually, the law school movie is clearly legally blonde, but the second the law school movie is The Paper Chase. And he is the model of the intimidating professor that uses the Socratic method in law school. What's the Socratic method? You've probably already heard of it, but it's an idea of teaching where the professor is the one who asks questions and elicits answers from the students, that it's not the professor actually lecturing. Now, in its purest form, um, starting back 120 years ago at Harvard Law School, Christopher Langdell uh, changed legal education. It used to be people literally reading out of Blackstone's commentaries, this kind of treatise of law, like straight from the book. It was horrible. Langdell revolutionized law school teaching at the time by requiring students to try to understand legal reasoning from the source materials, the cases. Um, sounds great. He would do this not by lecturing, but by simply asking question after question after question after question. Uh, I've kind of gone back and forth in how I've thought of Langdell over the years, but overall I think he's great. Um, because for his time, he revolutionized uh, the method and he was apparently a brilliant, warm, engaging teacher. Most professors, uh, using this method aren't as skilled and have much larger classrooms than I think Langdell did in his time. So class feels just like intimidation. 
uh, Snape is the more modern analog of how you experience your law school professor. Um, uh, just kind of sending death rays at you um, when you're on call in class. So this is a perfect formula for stress and a reaction that is counterproductive to your law school success. You've got tons of supposedly mandatory reading. You've got a bunch of Hermione's or Brainy Smurfs or Velma or Thelma, somebody help me here uh, in the chat. Uh, And a bunch of professors, let's see what the chat says. Velma, thank you. Um, I was gonna lie and say that I grew up in a household with no Vs. There really isn't V in Korean, but then I didn't really speak Korean that well. So um, thank you for that. Um, so you've got your piles of reading that you do because you're worried about being called on and interrogated in class and looking stupid in front of uh, in front in front in front of a bunch of Hermione's or Brainies or Velma's. Um, all this is peer pressure to overwork by doing tons of reading. This is how most students respond. Uh, so there's Hermione. There stacks of work and there is Diana's general aunt. It's been a long time since I've seen Wonder Woman, but you know, she keeps just shouting at Diana, you will train 10 times harder. Um, I used to also put up a picture of the horse boxer from Animal Farm. I will work harder, but this is exactly how most of your peers will respond to that pressure, that there must be something you work on what's in front of you. Uh, so you just grab the books and you read and you read and you read and you hope that that is the secret to success. Um, you also have people who take down totally complete indiscriminate notes, borderline transcripts and write everything down as gospel, even if the professor is using some form of the Socratic method where they're actually commenting on what a a student has said about a case and not necessarily telling you the right answer. They may be in devil's advocate mode, but you might hear that wrong and just write it down. Um, and I think a lot of this comes from the college attitude. Um, and, and this is not a losing strategy in college that if you do exactly what your professor says, you'll do well, um, or this sense that your professor cares about you and your own uh, academic success. So this leads to, and I've seen this happen, I've worked with students who've done this, like they read, they read, they read, maybe they outline, they're pulling all-nighters and they kind of avoid self-care, they're not exercising or taking care of themselves. Um, and, um, and that's that. So I'll just pause for a second because I'm getting um, it's some, some variants of these questions, and um, I'm happy to answer these at the end, but uh, since I'm talking about this now, it's relevant. I mean, one question, I won't read out the, the, the people saying it, but you can see it in the chats. Do people have overwhelming anxiety when they see so much reading? I think a lot of people do. Um, uh, and any tips on burnout? Uh, and I will get to, to all of these. And I think some of my advice is, is not, uh, um, is not exactly, I'll, I'll explain it in a second, but some variants of the question also, I think, any advice on how to feel prepared, prepared for classes, what happens, they do not understand what they're reading. Do you have any advice on how to read cases without getting lost in jargon? How do you respond to your professor if you answer their questions wrong? Okay. This is, this is exactly what I want to get to. Um, and, and you can answer in the chat, answer in the chat. Is it a big fear of yours to look stupid in class? Especially some of the people who, 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 um, yes. Okay. Uh, many people wrote it 
uh, wrote in and said, yes, yes, totally. Uh, one dude said no. Cool. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Um, let me ask you a question and please answer in the chat. Well, for everyone who said yes, what do you think the relationship is between being able to answer a professor's questions, not looking stupid in class, and your grade? What's the chance? So I'll, sorry. No, no, let me, let me be even more, let me be even more clear. Do you think that if you do badly in answering a question in class, you will not get a good grade in law school? Okay, I'm seeing no's across. Maybe no, not necessarily no. Yes, not really. Okay. So people are worried about not looking like they understand the material. Your peers may not want to work with you. I think these are all totally valid feelings and concerns. But the thing you have to remember, this is where we're going to turn. You've got you've to kind of follow me as I, as I go this way. Um, there's almost no relationship between how good you are in class and, and your ultimate grade. Um, I'll tell you this thing. I used to keep a spreadsheet. Um, let, me, let me back up. You will see in, even in syllabi, you don't even have to take my word for it. Ask, even ask your professor. Uh, a professor will often say that good class participation can raise your grade half a grade and not being prepared can lower it or, uh, you know, or a half a grade. Um, but this is rarely enforced. And even so, it's half a grade. Uh, so think about this. Are you, is it really worth it to spend 40 hours for the marginal end of maybe pushing a B plus to an A minus if you could focus that time to just get the A outright? I suppose that's kind of, uh, feel free to answer in the chats as well. Um, but it's sort of a rhetorical question. So someone said, um, how is that possible? Um, one thing to, sorry, I'll ask, answer the question again. Um, and it's sort of rhetorical. Uh, do you think it's worth it to spend 20 to 30 hours or more just preparing to look good in class? And what would happen if instead you spent that time, or at least even half of that time, really preparing for the thing that matters for your grade? So I'm seeing, I'm seeing, but are the readings, let me, let me um, pause on the chats because there's one, it's hard to kind of scroll up and I, I'm trying to get to one, one question that I think kind of nails the concern on the head. Um, but are the readings, this is in the text, relevant to other assignments which have a greater correlation with your grades, okay? And this is where we're going to turn the corner. You're going to follow me into Netherland here, okay? Is it possible to have good participation and still have good grades? Are those contradictory? How do you know which information is important? Um, big difference between business school and law school. Business school, you are graded on in-class participation. You do case studies, you discuss business cases, and that's a lot of your grade. Law school, 100% of your grade. You don't get assignments. Maybe some, some professors more and more are giving midterms, but it's like 10% of your grade. Traditionally, and still I would say in the vast majority of 1L classes, your grade is 100% the final exam. Um, all right, I've got uh, someone, your Zoom login is M Field. Did you want, you've raised your hand. Did you want to, to talk? Let me see if I can unmute you or you can unmute. If you can unmute yourself, feel free. Okay, I gotta, I gotta promote you to panelist M Field. You're on.
Uh, okay. Uh, I'm not hearing a question if you're ans uh, asking it. Okay. So you've got a lot of questions. I'm going to keep moving through though, okay? Uh, because um, what I say will kind of get to a lot of this. Okay. Uh, someone has just mentioned that some of the chats can't be seen the participants. So um, I've invited a lot of questions. Can we, unless it's, let, let, me, let me do this. I've got a decent amount still to go through. Why don't hold off on the chats until we get to a formal question section, unless it's directly relevant to what I'm saying. A lot of these are generally relevant to worrying about how to proceed in law school, but let me, let me get through, see if I will answer your questions, and then, and then we'll proceed, okay? And M Field, you're still muted, but I don't know what question you had. All right. Law school is not college. I forget who this is. I think it's Susan Estridge. I, I'm not 100% sure in law school. This is Will Ferrell from, from old school. This is how I would kind of taxonomize, for lack of a better word, the differences between college and law school. Um, and, you know, these are generalizations, but I find that these are directionally correct. College mostly, especially in, in I think, uh, arts and humanities and social sciences are more about passive learning and the accumulation of knowledge. Law school, it, in order to be successful, it is about active learning and the accumulation of both knowledge and concrete skills. Um, in college, you've got four years and you've got time to recover from a bad first semester. You really will be judged on how well you do in college overall. In law school, your first year, and a, a lot of the times your first semester makes your destiny. You either nail it or you don't. You, you don't really have three years to do well. Um, in college, depending on where you are, there's great inflation. I went to a great inflated school where a third of people graduated with honors. In law school, whether they give out A's or high passes, there are schools, um, a lot of the big ones that have gotten done away with straight letter grades, uh, Harvard most notably recently, but for many years, Berkeley uh, and Yale, definitely first year. Um, even so, there's a strict distribution as to who will get the top grades and who will just end up being middle of the pack. Like mathematically, the, the professors are required to follow those guidelines. Top five to 10% get A's or A minuses, it depends. And it's kind of a range, maybe down to, to the top 15% in any given class to get an A minus. But a flat A is five to 7% of the class most of the time. Um, in college, you do the work and you do it well and you generally uh, will do well, you'll get A's. In law school, there are a million, honestly a million heartbreak stories where people um, um, where people will work hard and then uh, hide the ball. And professors end up, sorry, I just got distracted for a second. Uh, you work hard, but professors are hiding the ball. They, there's all the pressure that I discussed before to really focus on memorizing kind of the obscure details of the different cases um, that you read. Uh, and it turns out the exam is not about that. In college, I remember there being all kinds of resources if you didn't feel that you were doing well. Uh, I, I don't, still don't think college a lot of the, the, the great colleges are still that great about uh, mental health or students. But I remember there actually being academic resource in college and law school, it was totally unclear to me where I would go. Uh, so this is what law school really looks like. Now, if you're like most people, you will spend something like 90% of your time reading really badly written cases over and over and over again. You in class, you will watch Snape grill a variety of Hermione's uh, in class on the details of those cases. And in some cases, you may never 
even understand the underlying law because the professor is asking, was this correctly decided? Was that correctly decided? And as I've said before, several times, all this produces huge pressure to read cases and not to look, uh, and pressure not to look stupid. But 100% of your grade actually depends on whether um, you can structure and solve a brand new legal problem that you have never seen. Um, and that honestly, uh, old cases and, and your notes don't help with at all. You have to use uh, facts that you've never seen before to find, develop, and resolve legal claims and defenses. And as I said before, to get A's, you've got to do this better than 90-95% of your class full of Brainy Smurfs and Velmas and Hermiones. Even worse, formally, there are no mechanisms that professors, they don't ask you to practice the kinds of issue and problem solving that you will face on your final exam. Um, let me just drill down on that for a second. What class is, is an analysis of appellate cases. The facts are given to you, um, and it's a discussion about whether, based on other precedent, the law was correctly decided. That is what you do in class. Sometimes a professor will talk about policy, sometimes law and economics, and some of their pet theories, but no matter what, 90% of it is them discussing a case sitting in the posture of an appellate court and deciding, was this case correctly decided given the law that's there? Um, that is not what you do on a final exam. Um, so someone has asked, um, do professors have office hours? Are you able to go to the professor to receive individual feedback, office hours, and the like? Let's back up all the way. Um, professors definitely have office hours, but most people use it to go in. This isn't, I'm, I'm not saying that this is the correct use. They will use it to go in and try to understand law that they didn't get in class. Um, the professor will not encourage you to do practice exams until, nearly the, until near the end of the semester. And um, the professor will not give you feedback. There, unless there's a midterm, you will not get any kind of feedback. And sometimes you just get the grade. Um, in law school, mostly, you never um, get your exam back unless you go and ask for it after the fact. Uh, mostly, you are on your own to go find, to go figure out some way to develop the skill of issue spotting and analysis. Um, so to um, O, um, who asked the question, uh, very few people will, so the professor will regard it as weird and that's their problem. Uh, if you go very early in the semester and you do a practice exam and you ask them to see it, they don't really wanna look at those things. Many simply won't. Um, I do have a couple of solutions to that as a, as a means of getting feedback so you can develop that skill. But most professors, some nice ones might look at a hypo that you've done and say, this is what you did right, but most won't. And honestly, um, they will seem intimidating to you or may even actively try to push you not to, to do that sort of thing. Okay. This is what a million law students have said that uh, most of their lives they were Hermione's and got straight A's and then they get their exam grades back, their, their final grades back uh, first semester in late December, early January, and they get not great grades for the first time. And if you think about that, especially at the elite law schools, like you have people with extremely high A, A averages, uh, three nine, three eight, three seven on average. Uh, and not all of those people can get A's. So it's the first time that many of them, maybe many of you will get not fantastic grades. And I mean, I, this is almost a direct quote from people who've come to me after a not so successful first semester. It's, I understood the material so well, but my grade just doesn't reflect it. 
I'm going to pause there and then, um, actually, I'm not going to invite questions. I'm just going to drink water for two seconds. Okay. So I think there are three strategies to win in law school. And to be very, very clear, um, I'm using strategy in a very particular sense in perhaps the economics as the science of scarcity sense in that you only have a limited amount of time and you have to pick the highest return activities. Um, you can't do everything. If you could do everything, everyone would do everything. <laughs> um, and if you think that everyone is Hermione and just as smart and just as diligent as you are, how is it that you can break out of the pack and get better grades? Uh, so you have to do things a little bit differently than everybody else uh, if you want those top grades. So these strategies are choices. They are resource choices. The resource being your limited time and attention. When I say you focus on these things, these three things, it may seem self-evident as I say it, but part of the reason I spent so much time trying to provide a background um, on the psychology and the social setting of law school is um, without understanding that at least a little bit, um, and you won't really fully understand this until you get there, but this is so that you have some warning in advance. These are the three things. If you follow these three guidelines, you stick to uh, doing these things and not doing other things, um, you should have good results, as have my students who followed my advice over the last 10 years. How do you hack anything? Um, how do you know that these are the right strategies? Uh, how many of you actually did this, started with the end game and worked backwards? You know what the front end looks like. All of you have a sense of what class is like and what you have to read, even before I showed the dumb piles of books and brainy smurf. But how many of you knew what the end game was, what it looked like, what it's asking? Um, so I don't play chess um, and I think my kids took like a lesson or two. Uh, but my understanding is really hardcore chess instruction starts with the end game. How do you beat, you know, how does king and pawn beat king? How do you actually finish off and win the game? Outside of chess and inside the law school context, the final exam is the end game. It is a complete end game given that most of the time it's 100% of your grade. What follows from that is then to ask what skills do I need to develop to do well on that exam? And then your day-to-day -day entire semester planning uh, is surrounded, is all based on the question, is the work that I'm doing going to help me develop those skills? Those are the questions I think you need to, to ask yourself. Um, and be critical in asking that of all of the activities that you engage in in law school. Um, so let's do the short version of this. What do you need to answer an exam question to get A's? Well, you need to start with legal knowledge, uh, which is understanding the black letter law, not the dumb case details. One of the kind of classic ones that is the very beginning of of the paper chases Hawkins versus McGee. It's about a, uh, somebody who um, was supposed to get um, a hair transplant or a skin transplant to fix like a burned hand, the hand burned by an electrical fire. And then the dude ends up getting like uh, a, a hairy hand instead because skin from a hairy area of his body got transplanted. Um, and so you can get into all kinds of details, but at the end of the day, that's a case about expectation damages. It's the theory, um, it's, it's the theory of recovery in most contract cases that did you get the benefit of the bargain? And in that case, there was all kinds of pain and 
and it's a very strange case and I'm, I'm spending a second on it because it's it's good for you to know what the difference is between black letter law and case details um in that case damages were also sought for just kind of the pain and suffering of the transplant the case ultimately says that like that's not part of the damages calculation the, the plaintiff wins uh, because he, he didn't get the kind of non-hairy hand he'd been promised, but pain and suffering would have been part, there's, you're cutting skin, so pain and suffering would have been part of uh, any procedure, um, even if you've gotten exactly what you'd asked for. So what you can ask for is uh, damages because your hand is hairy, not because the procedure hurt. Why do I say that? Uh, when you watch the paper chase, they talk a lot about the various details and, and the way that it got appealed at different levels um, from the trial court to the appellate level. But at the end of the day, it's the black letter law is the theory of expectation damages and what is and it isn't included in what you can recover when there's a breach of that contract. So you need to know this black letter law. Knowing that, um, you know, that the guy had a damaged skin because of an electrical, I think he touched an electrical outlet or something like that. Those are the kinds of things that the professor will ask you about in class and that will seem hyper important in the moment. On the exam, they are not important. That's got to be the foundation that you have legal knowledge. Then you've got to be able to use that legal knowledge to spot and analyze issues. Um, so you'll have a different case that does not involve surgery and does not involve a hairy hand. Can you apply those facts? Can you use that knowledge to actually spot an issue? Notice what happens, um, and this is one of the big shifts that professors don't identify. Just because you can read and pick apart a case does not mean that you have the skill of knowing how to take this abstract rule from Hawkins versus McGee. Um, and find that in a case that's in, in, in a context that is totally different. Um, that is, um, it's like the inverse. I mean, one example of this is you do vocabulary cards in a foreign language class and I've, failed at speaking very well, several foreign languages. But it's like you only studied um, the, um, the English to the, the German to English. Like if you see the German, you know what the English is. But on the spot, right? Let's just, just stop for a second. Think about that. If you see the German, you know what the English is. Great. Uh, but when you're in a place where what's required isn't just translating from the German, but you have to speak German. That is a totally different skill. And I think that's the inversion that takes place between what is kind of just passively taking in a case and being able to apply it. Um, so that's the first. You need the legal knowledge. You need to be able to use that legal knowledge to spot and analyze issues. And then you have to do so in a way that convinces your professor that you're better at this than most of your peers. So to me, this is the overall um, strategy to focus on the things that advance these three strategies and to generally try to avoid the things that don't advance your ability to either build up your legal knowledge, um, use that develop the skill to use that legal knowledge to spot and analyze issues and to do so in a way um, uh, uh, that's better than your peers. Um, so you can boil that down to master the law, master issue spotting, master your professor. It's really easy to say and it's hard to do. Um, So I'm going to pause there because I'm getting some questions and I, I, I do want to hold them and I'll get to them. But like the questions like, how do we learn to think like lawyers? I'm sorry for those of you who have to go back to work. I know that some of you are kind of 
doing both. So thanks for hearing me. Uh, I believe that Steve is going to post this. I'm going to try to take some of this and post it myself. So, um, I'm going to dig deeper into each each of these three things. And there's there's a way to do each of these three. Some of you have already asked, how do we do these and why is it hard? I'll answer the first one just going through my materials. And the second will be, um, uh, I'll, I'll come back to the second, why these things are hard. Uh, the short answer is most people are not focusing on these three things. They're just reading, they're just scrambling for dear life. What does it mean to master the law? Uh, what's the strategy for doing that? Um, what you want to do is begin to develop a uh, memory, whether it's memorized or just reasonably at your fingertips of the elements and factors of the various legal claims and defenses <clears throat> in, um, um, in a particular subject area like contracts or property or crim. Um, uh, so for instance, um, uh, there's a case involving an eggshell skull. There's a, there's a there's a doctrine called battery. So um, there was someone who, like a boy, kicked another one, but the guy had an eggshell skull, and so he collapsed. And there were all these things that were bad about it. Um, but again, there's a pile of facts, and then there's law that you can apply. Um, there are components of a legal claim that all have to be met for there to be. Uh, a, a winning case. So in the case of battery, the tort of battery, like say punching someone, it's an offensive, an intentional, one, offensive, two, touching, three, um, uh, without consent. Uh, you need to know that framework so that you can begin to use that to spot, uh, actually spot issues later. Um, how do you do that? Um, you can either pre-study by kind of reading what are called commercial outlines. They're uh, manuals or Gilberts, um, and I will be offering them later, uh, a little later this summer. Um, but they just set out what the law is. Uh, it, it'll just say battery and offensive touching without consent. You will not find in most um, uh, because they are case books, you will not find that simply broken out. The case book, the table of contents, is organized by case name, and sometimes the index refers to the different doctrines. But it's not a textbook. Um, you know, when they when they talk about realism in an international relations course, they don't bury it in a Henry Kissinger article. They simply tell you if it's a textbook, this is what realism is. Um, in this context, it's the commercial outline that tells you, that just straight up tells you what the black letter law is. Um, funny thing is, uh, they don't give you these in law school. Professors will tell you not to use them, or many will. And yet, how is it that people study for the bar exam? They have outlines. Barbary just provides you piles and piles of outlines. So. Um, I wish I could say that I invented my entire system myself. A lot of it I developed over the years in tutoring, but some of these things I knew because one of my friends who went to Harvard, not, not NYU law, uh, made me um, go, for, go to have a drink with him so he could break down law school to me. And he said, don't overread cases. Grab an outline. And he actually just gave it to me. He gave me his Barbary outline that he was studying, that he'd finished taking, studying for the bar and taking, which set out just the structure of the black letter law, like what the law is. And he said, and study this before you get to law school. Now, this isn't the reason that you study it, but um, to me, you study the black letter law so that you can begin to work on practicing issue spotting. Um, but it will help you with class and case understanding compared to most students um, who will try to glean their understanding of the law by reading and rereading and rereading cases. Now, there's some, I don't know what you call it, uh, maybe it's the kind of uh, Max Weber and the, the, the kind of Protestant ethic. Um, 
that you may have in mind that like there must be some purpose to the suffering of reading cases repeatedly and there isn't. I am not going to tell you don't read the cases. I do think that the best way to be prepared for class is to read to one, spend the time reading the outlines over the summer. You can also, that's what I call pre-studying the law. You can also side study the law by kind of reading relevant parts of an outline to the cases that you're reading. And this is made possible by the fact that both Gilbert's and Emanuel's, they key their outlines to most of the major case books. So you can kind of use the outlines to, um, to kind of understand the law of the cases that you're supposed to be reading and then read the case and then just put it to bed and not spend more time uh, belaboring that. Read the cases the night before, pre-study or side study with commercial outlines and then um, and then do the best that you can based on that in class. You will be just as prepared or not more prepared than someone who's read the case 10 times. And as I say, even if you're not, as long as you're semi-competent, it won't matter. I wrote this thing about like heart surgery versus uh, map of the circulatory system. A lot of law school, I love this analogy, is like medical school if it were done backwards. You know, you usually do a dissection of a cadaver kind of late in medical school. But it's as if law school decided to flip that script and decide, you know, the best way to learn uh, about just what the circulatory system looks like, it's not giving you a map of it, it's we're just going to make you cut into an actual human heart and you just have to figure out what the rest of the circulatory system looks like. Or you have to kind of do open heart surgery and I hope you figure out what the circulatory system how it functions and what it looks like. Rather than being given the simpler step of this is this is the overall view, this is what it looks like, this is how it works. Um, law school flips that and makes you dig for that information and it's stupid. Um, uh, so I, I want to answer a question. So we shouldn't read a case in its entirety, in entirety? no. You, you should and only the night before. So there are people who will like get ahead of their reading. There are all kinds of misbegotten strategies. People who will read the case like five times until they get it. You don't get a prize for understanding the case on your own. Use, I don't know how to say this, use, you know, use the damn shortcut. Use the outline to understand the law and then read the case. Um, that way you read it once and you get as much out of it as someone who's read it five or ten times or reads it the week before. And then just read it the night before and that's it. Next step is master issue spotting. So this involves a couple of things. Um, one is learning the technique and one is <laughs> the algorithm to practice that. Uh, maybe I'm overusing the word algorithm. Learn the mechanics through something called IRAC. This is, this is the basic structure of, of, of issue spotting, of issue analysis. Um, so you've got to learn the mechanics. You've got to actually practice. I, I didn't know how else to say this. I love terrible acronyms like Kit Cools. Tapiad, take a practice exam a day. Now this might be an exaggeration. Maybe you can't do that, but it's important to start as early as you can um, to practice regularly, multiple times per week, ideally every day, but if you're doing three to four times a week, that will probably, starting earlier on, that will put you pretty far ahead of your peers. And then get feedback. So this is coming back to the questions that you, some of you would ask. Go to your professors if you can, ask them to look at your practice exam answers, but many will not do that. But teaching assistants have a harder time telling you no. Um, and I think very often they will help you. An alternative is to trade exam with peers. So if you have a study group, all agree to all take the same practice exam or hypo. And sometimes you can find model answers. Now, another answer is kit cools where I actually have a system for, for feedback and um, uh, conscious deliberate practice, but that's in a bit. 
Someone asked, are TAs trustworthy? Uh, it doesn't matter. Um, it's feedback. It's someone who, so a TA is someone who is not perfect. They're not a professor, but they're generally someone who got a very good grade in the class that they are TAing. And for instance, I was a, I was a TA for both criminal law and um, public international law. And so my job, um, <clears throat> because my professors were somewhat enlightened, they had me write up uh, a hypo. This is how I got in this business in the first place. And then administer it to anybody who wanted to take it and to give them all feedback. So I gave individual feedback. And I wouldn't say no to someone who came to office hours and do it. Now, am I, I am not a perfect proxy for what professor likes. I may know my professor better than you do. You've got to develop your own understanding, but the professor's better than nothing. We're not talking about ideal or trustworthy or not. It's getting outside of yourself. You do not write as well as you think you do. That's true of all of us. We need editors. We need someone to review what we've written to tell us the gap between the good ideas that we had and how badly we actually articulated them. You will get better. You will absolutely get better with practice, but you got to practice and you got to get that feedback somewhere. Um, I'm getting more specific uh, questions, but let me put them aside. Um, the questions I got so far are kind of uh, details. Master your professor, what do I mean by that? <clears throat> uh, study what they do. Listen to their vocal mannerisms in class. Don't listen to their study advice, but listen to how they discuss something. Um, so some people will say, oh, if like, I'll just be frank. A lot of my friends are law professors and some of them have gone over my materials and they, they're like, yeah, this is good advice, but they should totally read cases and they should do these things. So I've written an article that kind of got me banned from above the law ultimately called Rainbow Vomit. I've posted it on my own blog. The problem is that, you know, your law professors are not Gordon Ramsay. They're not judges of food and expert cookers of food uh, in the sense that they may give advice, but law school exams are graded blind. Professors think they have an idea of what causes people to do successful or not. They like to think it's people who, who reread the cases and only listen to what they say. Um, but it's not quite that. They actually don't have a basis for knowing. They don't analyze the data. Um, so they don't necessarily know why, their student, why certain students are successful and why they don't. They are judges. So in the sense, if Gordon Ramsay doesn't like something, well, Gordon Ramsay is Gordon Ramsay, but like, I'm talking like some of the other cooking shows where you have non-chefs judging food um, or a restaurant critic, they are, they are experts in, in what they like. So you have to cater to that. They are not experts in knowing how to cook that thing that they like. Otherwise, they would be the chefs. So how do you do that with your professor? And how do the other two bits help? Um, you focus really closely on language and their preferences and the kind of hypotheticals that they make up in class. So I'm going to give you a super specific example. My crim law professor <clears throat> at NYU Law was this guy named David Richards. And he loved to discuss this concept of uh, the intoxication defense. And there was a legal, there was a legal standard. There was a standard for how drunk you have to be to get by on, on an intoxication defense. It's um, basically something akin to the defense for insanity, which is like you, you have to be so drunk that you're unable to appreciate it at all what you are doing. And the example he always gave was he was a student uh, when he was a student, he visited the Soviet Union and, and he was in Leningrad. And at some point he drank an entire bottle of vodka and found himself crawling on his hands and knees uh, across the Nevsky Prospect. Um, why do I say that? Uh, he wanted us to use his language. He didn't want us to use stilted legal language like the intoxication, like intoxication sufficient to get, negate specific intent. He wanted us just to say, you know, X was Leningrad drunk because he couldn't remember where he was. It's not just being buzzed by a couple of beers. It's 
Leningrad drunk. Um, but that became a technical term in his class. If you tried to sound legally, legalistic, or like you were speaking legalese and you said, um, and you used that mouthful of words, intoxication, he can invoke the intoxication defense. He just wanted you to write the words Zeus. He loved classical characters in his exams. Zeus was LD, and that was enough. So you have to speak the professor's language. Now, you can't do that for another law professor uh, who doesn't use that language, but every law professor has their own rhythms and the ideas they like, certain types of arguments that they like. Um, you have to listen for those things. How can you listen better for those things and, and kind of separate the wheat from the chaff? If you master the law, if you pre-study the law, if you know what the cases are about before you get to class, class time is not the time to be trying to figure out what a case means. It's the wrong time. You're not going to find that wisdom in class. Um, you need to have that under your belt. Class is not, should not be the first time you begin to understand a piece of black letter law. If you have pre-studied or side-studied the law so that you understand the black letter law before you get there, you are free to focus and relax and begin to really hear what the professor is saying. Someone who is drowning, who is scrambling to understand what is going on, who's taking notes on everything, won't know won't have the mental bandwidth to pick up on these nuances. Sometimes they're not even nuances, but sometimes they are. Um, and sometimes a professor can be simpler than you think. Um, I got an A in a visiting professor's class and I wasn't, I was a little unconfident. He spent the entire, he came from Georgetown. He's a wonderful professor uh, for criminal procedure. And he spent the entire time talking about his pet theory, representation reinforcement. What is it that the courts should step in um, it's in the case of, um, of discrete and insular minorities um, that cannot use political power, see if any of this sounds familiar with recent events, cannot use political power, i.e. voting to obtain legislative results, the courts should step in and, and fix things. That comes from Caroline Products footnote number four, when the Supreme Court decided to get out of the business of what's called substantive due process to knock down laws that they don't like. Instead, they focused on procedural. So why do I say that? Um, sometimes if you use the right keywords over and over and over again, the professor will feel heard. Sometimes you'll feel silly for overusing the words, but in my case, it wasn't silly. Uh, because it got the A. Okay, so this is how I kind of see things. Um, uh, these different strategies build on each other. If you have to start with mastering the law, you can't issue spot if you don't have the law and you can't master your professor unless honestly you're doing these things at a competent level. If you've actually mastered the law, you'll get, you know, you might, you might luck out, but you'll probably get B plus or somewhere less. If you can actually issue spot, even if you're not kind of doing these nuanced things about picking up and, and reflecting back to your professor, their language, uh, you can get in a, in a bigger range, but I'm almost, I'm very sure no one who's been good at issue spotting did worse than B pluses. They're more likely to get something in the A minus to A range but you can end up all through here if you're not picking up on the nuances. If you're doing all three, um, this is not obviously scientific, it's conceptual, but in my experience, this is the foundation, this is the, <laughs> the building, and this is the cherry on top of mixing metaphors. Um, but if you build up and you're actually doing these well enough that you're doing this, that you're listening attentively to your professor, you should be doing very well in law school. I want to go through briefly on issue analysis, but I want to double check for um, some questions that have come on. Um, I'm going to come back to some of these uh, questions. Um, 
purchase, you can buy commercial outlines, by the way, on Amazon. Um, I was going to say when you get to campus, but many of you will not get to campus. So I would say Amazon, uh, eBay has them. You can buy used copies of what's called Barbary Convisor Mini Review. Um, and as I said before, uh, I, I'll start to, to release them uh, probably first to my students within Kid Cools because I'm kind of dissatisfied with what's out there a little bit. Um, and that I just want to do my own. But Gilbert's and Emmanuel's served me well, they'll serve you as well. So I'm going to type in here you know, just Gilbert's, Emmanuel's law outlines. Check them out on Amazon. Try to get used copies on eBay or somewhere else. If you go to top law schools or some of the other websites, I think people are willing to trade or sell them for, for a discount. But um, I, I'll take a question before I turn to issue analysis and I'm gonna uh, allow Ali to talk. Are you able to, I'm gonna unmute you. I don't know why it's not working. Ali, are you uh, able to unmute yourself? I'm going to stop. Um, okay, I'm hitting the unmute button like five times. I'm going to promote you to panelist. I don't know if that, that did it. No, I think I ended up getting rid of you. Okay, we're gonna talk about issue analysis briefly. Uh, sorry, uh, the thing that I put into the, the text, I was able to get to everyone. Sorry about that. I did just end up sending that to the panelists. Um, Ali and Enfield, I'm trying to unmute you, but I don't know why it's not working. So if you can unmute, great. If you can try to ask in the text, um, sorry, in the chat, that would be great too. Okay, so on issue analysis, what is an issue? Um, on a final exam. An issue is an important fact or set of facts in a story that begs further analysis. So it's a fact that suggests that one party could at least consider bringing a legal claim against another. This doesn't mean that it has to be a successful claim. And in fact, the best issue spotters and the best exams actively search out if he claims. Why would you do that in real life? Well, we can try to predict what will happen before a judge, but it's a probabilistic art. And sometimes um, you're not given perfect facts. Sometimes you're given very bad facts and you might advise your client, I don't think you should sue or I don't think you should continue with the case and the client will want to go forward anyway. And then you set the strategy, but the client makes the, these kind of big choices, sue, not sue. And so you do the best that you can. And so sometimes you only have iffy claims. The limit on how iffy they are is you can't misrepresent things to the court or you can be sanctioned and lose your license. Um, but things that are short of that, uh, um, you can try. There's, there's enough wiggle room to bring iffy claims. And then, in my case, um, um, when I was at a smaller law firm and I had individual clients where I could try to work out different legal theories, um, it didn't always win the case for them, but it sometimes bought them time. It bought them credibility with the judge. It allowed us to push back. So life isn't about simply finding winners because you don't always in real life get to make up your own facts. Um, it's what you can do with what little you're given. Sometimes you have to say, there's nothing here, but 
you can't say that unless you've really looked for iffy claims. So that's what we're looking for. That's what an issue is. It's a fact that triggers further analysis. What is issue analysis? So once you've got an issue, issue analysis is the process of helping you decide if a legal claim would succeed or not. So that's at a general, specifically you take the black letter law. Uh, you'll spot the issue because the fact will go to one or more, uh, will clearly uh, to you go to one or more of the elements uh, or factors. And then so you look for the facts to fit each element or factor. Um, you think about how the other side might argue that and you conclude. So the framework for that is IRAC issue rule analysis and conclusion. I have a specific way that I do that. I don't think this is the framework so much as a description of what any successful answer will include, whether you address these super explicitly or not. They, they will all include these things. Um, just as any sentence uh, will contain, an actual sentence will contain a subject and verb and maybe objects and other things and dependent clauses, but the key is um, it will have it. You don't have to always say subject, Larry, verb, goes to the park. Um, it's there. An issue is a summary of the fact took plus the name of the claim you're going to analyze. So I think the issue is one of the hardest things to actually write down. A lot of the things are clear, but the issue is a weird summary of what you're about to do. You don't have to get into a lot of detail, just so there's a hook that catches your eye and then you list the, the rule that makes, that you think you'll have to apply. That's all you have to do. So um, I don't know why Charlie Brown is punching Lucy, uh, but um, this is a perfectly good issue. It's not even a full sentence, but Charlie Brown punches Lucy battery. So it might be Lucy versus Charlie Brown punch battery, but it's just there. The rule. Um, you have to uh, apply a rule. Professors may have different views on whether they want you to state the rule or not, but most, I think with most, it's not a bad idea uh, to show that you know the rule. You restate uh, the black letter law exactly as the professor wants it, set out all the fa elements or factors, and then you actually straight up use numbers to identify each element because you're gonna use them in your analysis. So the elements of intent to kill murder in the context of criminal law are unlawful, intentional killing of another human being. Uh, the elements of battery are an intentional, offensive touching of another person uh, without consent. Uh, I'm going to try to deal with the... Uh, um, yeah, I, I'm not able to unmute. Um, was using a battery claim example to exemplify a fact hook concept and intentional pun. Uh, I'm so dim, I don't know what the pun is in this. Uh, all right, sorry. I guess it wasn't intentional if I don't even get the joke. Haha, -ha, it's on me. Um, Uh, analysis, it shouldn't say conclusion at the top. So an analysis is a fitting of any appropriate fact or fact interpretations to each element. And you start by those that are in support of the claim, whoever's going to bring the claim. And then you look at those in support of the other side and you come to a conclusion on that element. Uh, that means that on easy elements, you probably don't want to say a lot or you don't need to say a lot. So let's say we're talking about battery. Um, if there's a touching, if someone kicked someone else, you don't need to overanalyze. There's no counter argument to the fact that a foot touched somebody else. But a lot of issues, especially those involving mental elements, are really open to interpretation where there can be a he said and she said and some kind of back and forth between the plaintiff and defendant on a claim. So in, intent or offense, offense is a little more objective, but intent may not be. And you'll see kind of more back and forth on that in an analysis. In a conclusion, you render a, a prediction as to who would win based on case law. Um, and so I, I went and talked about Hawkins versus McGee. 
it sets the black letter law, but there are also case outcomes um, that are generated in, in those cases that you read. And so you try to predict who would win and why um, based on not just which arguments seem more compelling, but in light of the, of the law of the cases that you've read, uh, if you were a court, which side would you side with? So this is difficult because it involves multiple shifts of perspective, taking uh, as completely and zealously as you can the side of the claimant, then that of the person has to defend the claim, and then kind of pulling out from, from those very subjective positions to a more objective one of a court having to weigh those claims and declare one side a victor. Again, and just coming back to this, I won't belabor it. This is a skill. This is not just knowledge. You can't, you can't, uh, like in the Matrix, just download Kung Fu. You actually have to practice. There, uh, you're building a mile in sheath in your mind. Um, it, this kind of work is just as much of a skill as, uh, you know, my middle age crisis is trying to do skateboard tricks, and they're really hard, and it's. It's muscle memory that's built up over time. So I can ollie, I can't kick flip yet, um, but those are not things that you can just read and pick up. And, you know, don't mistake this. Um, you're writing an exam, it feels like mental stuff, but in that sense, in the myelin sheath that's being built, in the muscle memory that you're trying to build, it's actually almost a physical act. Uh, that you have to practice because not only do you have to get good at issue spotting, you want to get better at it than your peers. And the way to do that is to practice earlier. So quick word on how do you structure your semester? This is what a typical semester looks like. Let me pause there. Based on the advice that I've, I've kind of I've given, I think this is what a semester should look like or this is what one typically looks like. You get to law school, you frantically read your brief cases. This is like summarizing them for no really good reason other than, and some law schools like Wash U, they will say that it's mandatory to brief cases. Um, uh, I have students who just didn't anyway. Um, so August, October, most people be frantically reading and briefing. Then some point you're told to outline. Nobody knows what that is, uh, or at least it wasn't very clear to me at the time why I should outline. Then maybe you get to some practice exams, but you're not, you're doing what everyone else is doing. You take exams. And then again, there's not that much self-care. Maybe you go out a lot, uh, or you pull too many all-nighters, even if you're not drinking. Um, not ideal. My student semesters are steady from August to December. You're kind of working constantly. You're outlining from the beginning. I'm not gonna talk about that on this call much more. You're gonna pre-study or side study the law. You're reading the cases, but not over reading them. You're gonna read them once the night before with the guidance, with the kind of shortcut help of, of, um, of your commercial outline. And you're gonna practice hypos and issue spotting from the beginning so that that muscle is nice and strong and fast by the time you get to exams. So late November, early December, you work on past exams by your specific professor. That is, you're saving, um, that's, that works with mastering your professor in that you can take other exams and hypos during the year. Uh, during the semester, but as you get closer to the final exam, you want to kind of really hone in on your professor's mindset. And you do that by taking, saving for last, the very last practice exams you will take are the ones that your professor um, uh, makes available. Some don't make them available at all. Some are more generous. Most are in between and maybe make one or two available at the end of the semester. So weekly, this means take a practice exam a day. This is an exaggerated, perhaps, I, very few actually do this. If you do, you will just be a machine, but it's probably hard for reasons that I haven't gotten around to figuring out. But many of my students have taken three to four practice, at least spend uh, uh, time working on a practice problem every other day during the semester or, or during the summer. I have students who are just plowing through my course now and doing that. Um, but weekly, they're pre-studying the law. 
they're taking a practice exam, they're keeping up with reading, but they're not over reading. They're outlining from the beginning and they're being human. You wanna work hard, but this has to be sustainable. Um, and what's most important on an exam, sorry, this is a side note that I haven't written down, is ultimately creativity. You cannot be creative if you're exhausted. Um, you can't be creative if you're panicked. Create, creativity comes from some pressure. You're gonna feel enough stress taking the exam, but you can't be exhausted. So you've gotta take care of yourself. Um, the other thing is um, avoid resume filling extracurriculars. There's only one extracurricular, honestly, that matters. And that is law journal or law review your 2L year. 1L year, you should not be doing any other curriculars. Uh, that like moot court or anything for the reason of filling a resume. What matters are your grades and law review and whatever work experience that you might develop over those summers, not whether you did moot court or something else or you were in some club. I don't want to discourage people. If there's something that you absolutely love um, and it's that or you know that you want to be a trial lawyer, so moot court might help, fine, but you're losing time that you could be spending focusing on exams and doing well. Um, you'll have plenty of time to get trial practice later. Okay, I'm gonna stop there before um, going. Uh, I'll answer a couple more questions uh, about the course. One question is, would you recommend then not networking until after 1L? How can you establish professional relationships? Notice that I mentioned socialize. Um, get to know, so this is my uh, kind of squishy uh, view. There are different law schools. Um, I didn't go to Columbia. Um, it was the other school uh, north that <laughs> competed with NYU really. Um, I understood it was competitive and kind of stressful. Um, NYU, um, NYU was really friendly and people went out a lot and professors and our dean who was Sexton um, before he became president of NYU as a whole encouraged us to help each other. So we did. I mean, ultimately we are competing on the exam, but I never, it, you know, you, you read these ridiculous stories of people tearing books up in the library so other people can't use them. That's just short-sighted and just dumb. You're not going to get ahead that way. You're going to get ahead by developing your issue spotting muscle. Um, you will hear bandied about that there are magical outlines out there written by students. The best outline is the one that you write because it locks the law into your head. Um, and so sharing, being as cooperative as, as you can is I think one of the best ways to be a mensch, sorry to use the, the masculine, but to be just a worthy, good person. In a way, that's the best marketing that you can do for your future life and just hang out and appreciate people for who they are. Um, this isn't just utilitarian. You will do business with people you like because they're your friends because you like them. Um, that's what I would say about that. What is the final exam like? Short response, multiple choice, true, false. None of those. Um, there are more and more some multiple choice aspects to exams, but again, the majority of exams are long facts. It's like a long story that's told. I'll show it to you in the demo that I'm about to do in my course. And um, uh, it's not short response. Now, that's for the most part. Um, but I would still say, again, the super majority of exams are you're given a long story. And at the very end, it'll say discuss. And you have to pick out the claims that could be that, 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 that someone could bring the defenses and who would win. How would you balance your studies in winding down? Um, I think by following a schedule rigorously in that you work when you work and then when you're not working, I mean, that's how you wind down, you don't work. If, if you're religious uh, or not, uh, I don't know why this should be self-evident, I am not. Jewish, but like my roommate in college would, was, he teaches at Harvard Law School now, he, um, he would always, he wasn't super religious, but 
he always would observe Shabbat. He would just Friday afternoon shuts his books um, and he, he reads something for fun. He relaxes Saturday. And then if you feel like it, he'll go to party Saturday night or he'll work. Um, Which is better to live in dorms or outside campus? I think it depends on where you go to law school. If you go to commuter school, then everyone's in the same boat. Um, I went to NYU. There were two main dorms. There were people, I mean, I lived in New York. I'd worked there before. I had my life, but I decided to immerse myself. And not only, I think, was it helpful for like not having to commute, um, but I think your friendships develop a lot closer if you grab a beer. I too much of honestly, and I kind of regret this in retrospect, like too much of law school revolved around alcohol. My um, counterbalance was my first year roommate was uh, Mormon. I grew up with a lot of Mormons in Nevada. And I guess, I mean, I lived in New York, but my parents at the time still lived in Nevada. So I guess someone who did... <laughs> um, who matched people said, oh, this poor kid from Nevada and this poor kid from Utah should be together in the big scary city of New York. Um, but, you know, without drinking, I mean, he would sometimes come out to the bars, but he wouldn't drink. And I would go and hang out with his kind of Mormon crew. There was a decent number at NYU Law and just hang out and have cookies and stuff. Um, so that's harder to kind of make those connections if you don't live on campus. Now, Obviously, law school is expensive. You have to weigh that, but um, uh, I would try to um, I try to live on campus if I could. Um, just going through some of the questions at random. Don't brief cases at all. Yes, do not brief cases. Um, Sorry, it's uh, so sorry. Yes, um, is there any concern for living on campus next semester due to the pandemic? Uh, let me let me walk some of this back. Um, I just don't. I think most. Well, it depends on your law school. Um, I don't, personally, I don't, I mean, I don't know anything more than you guys. I don't foresee this pandemic winding down any time in the next year. Uh, so I guess my advice on living on campus may be for those who are starting law school the year, not this fall, but next fall, hopefully by then they've got a vaccine. Um, I don't know what the difference is living on campus or not with the pandemic, I suppose many, if I, I just I'm trying to imagine the scenario where the law school makes you show up uh, to do in person classes. I, I can't imagine that they're going to have online classes and then make you live on campus. So um, Pass exams are typically made available for practice. That's a question. Some professors do, many do not. Uh, or some will hide their exams and then kind of make them available the last couple of weeks before school, uh, before exams start. Uh, I think online this may even be harder. Uh, wh what should I do now to prepare for the semester? So uh, I would pre-study the law um, and then begin to dig around for practice exams or hypos. My online course, Kit Cools, is meant to make that easier by, I'll talk about that in a second, um, but I would pre-study the law. The thing, the thing, the one thing you can't do until the semester starts is study your professor, to master your professor. You can totally pre-prepare by getting as much black letter law under your belt as you can of the 1L topics and then practicing hypos as much as you can. Um, there's a question about narcolepsy. I, I really don't feel qualified to answer that question. Um, um, 
I'm, you know, if law school's online, perhaps life can be easier. Um, I, I don't understand the, the, the disease well enough or the, the condition well enough to, to really help you. Um, uh, I, I do think that you can still prepare in advance. Um, law school, uh, is law school year round or broken down into semesters? It's broken down into semesters. Uh, it depends on the school. Most do a fall and spring semester. Some like Chicago and Stanford will do trimesters or quarters, but basically you'll have three uh, time periods where you get grades. Um, Um, law school, something about law schools offering dorms or having to live on your own. I think it depends on the law school and in the, I, it's hard to say. So let me restate that question. Do law schools offer dorms for law students or do we have to live on our own? It depends on the law school and it depends on what happens this year, which we don't know. Uh, they may not, they may tell law students not to come to campus at all. Um, they'll lose money. So uh, there have to be things that are more important than money, but that is what law schools will be dealing with and hopefully they end on the right side and don't make people come to campus. What makes a good law professor? I don't know. I'm not a law professor. Um, I, I just, I can tell you subjectively that just there are professors who were kinder. Um, they didn't just do pure Socratic method. They really seemed to care about students and they made me excited about any particular part of the law. Um, resume filling in order of importance, not important. If you don't have the grades, your resume will not save you. Um, uh, I'll say that again. Um, it, do not fill your resume with crap. This is, this is what I've been trying to say. Like focus on getting the good grades um, and everything else should work out. Don't come up with backup plans. Put all your eggs in the basket of getting good grades. Um, you still have two more years to fill your resume with things if you want to, but you only have this one chance to nail it your first year. Let me explain again, why is the first year so important? Because it, most interviews for jobs and clerkships after law school start um, the summer after your 1L year. And so all the plum jobs, all the important federal jobs, the Department of Justice, the State Department, all the big corporate law jobs and the clerkships, they fill up, basically start interviewing at the beginning of 2L semester based on your 1L grades, and then the jobs are gone. Uh, there's some exceptions. You can sometimes, you know, if you're a good student already, you can always interview for something else. People will like that. But if you can't get something, it can be very hard if you don't. Um, and honestly, in my experience, not so many people somehow have an entirely bad 1L year and then resurrect themselves. I, there are very few exceptions to that. Um, do I have any additional advice on how to defeat intellectual discrimination? I'm happy to hear on what that might be. Um, I... Uh, I'll, I'll be frank, I've done lectures for SEO Law, which is a program that I did, did it for three years. Um, this internship program that hires generally uh, underprivileged um, uh, uh, students of color. Um, and probably most of my, more often than not, my own Larry Law Law students, someone who come to me privately, tend to be the children of immigrants. Um, a lot of them are Asian, a lot of them are not. Um, uh, I don't know, um, oh, I see, I'm sorry. Individuals with disabilities are professors more open to meet their students where they are. I don't have a sense of that. Um, I guess it depends on the type of disability. Um, the funny thing about the law is people, many lawyers, we're aware of the law, so they, I think, try to be somewhat more open-minded than they might be, say, in the straight business, straight-up business community. 
Um, I think all you can, I don't, um, I think just being assertive. I think nobody, there are plenty, people are plenty assertive in class. Um, even when I was in law school 20 years ago and even now, I think people are speaking up a lot about um, uh, professors saying things, dismiss, being dismissive in ways that they shouldn't or just not being aware of things. And I think um, if even the last few weeks to the last five years say, haven't taught us anything. It's, I think, just confronting them head on. Remember that the professor grades blindly. So I think, you know, being as respectful as you can, but asserting yourself when you think the professor uh, is being insensitive or is being dismissive um, is the way to go. Is it better to specialize in a particular type of law right away or later on after you have more classes under your belt? One L year is mostly mandatory classes, so you don't have a lot of time. You, uh, you, you don't, you know, some schools will permit like one elective your first year, but um, there's no way to specialize. You might have a sense of what you like. I took a lot of international law classes. I loved it. I don't do international law now. It was a part of my practice when I was still at a law firm. I'm, uh, I have a different kind of job now, which I won't uh, discuss. Um, um, electives, I, uh, languages, if you don't speak a language, I don't know that law school is the time to learn it. Um, um, I think it's just a matter of taking what interests you. I don't, you know, there are some requirements 2L and 3L year, and you'll just kind of deal with those. But other than that, like, it, it's kind of random. I don't, um, there's like one or two classes I wish I'd taken, but I'm really happy that I took the classes that I did. I don't, it doesn't matter too much is what I'm trying to say, I think. Okay. Um, I'll get to more questions at the end. I want to kind of go through show you my course and then I'll, I'll keep answering questions. Um, Kit Cools is kick the crap out of law school. It's been my course uh, for the last um, five years. Um, I kind of post this up here because basically you're in law school in pursuit of some kind of dream. Um, I don't agree with some of these, but um, maybe there's something that you want to do, um, some kind of institution that you want to work for, some kind of change that you want to see, or maybe you want to work in a law firm and make money. And not just because you're greedy, but maybe because you're the first to make it to college and then to law school in your family. And it would mean something, really mean something to your hardworking parents to see you live a materially better life. Um, and one of the great things about law, I think law practice is very hard. Um, I mean, I did it for more than uh, 10 years, about 10 years. Um, but one of the best things about it is that you have a chance, even when you're making money, to try to take some cases uh, pro bono uh, and, and to do things um, um, to kind of help people anyway. Um, but this is what brings you, this is what brought you to Steve uh, to get the best LSAT score that you can. And it's what I think is bringing you to me because you really, you want to get all of this right because you want to be able to um, reach this dream. Um, Um, it has a price, and this might be antiquated now. It's probably more than 250 in debt. Some places are straight up 100K a year. Um, your dream has a price. Law school is expensive. Uh, hopefully, you got money to where you're going, uh, from where you're going, but it's expensive. You're not working. You're going to face a really uh, potentially hard post COVID job market. I think there's going to be a lot of job loss in the next couple of years. and 
uh, either firms and places will be less likely to hire or they might end up reabsorbing people who lost their jobs and got them again. But there will be heavy competition for jobs. That's always been true since the big downturn in 2008. Uh, I don't know that job market ever recovered and then COVID struck another blow. Uh, so that I think this will be tough on the legal industry and on you. I touched on this a little bit before, but future jobs depend on your 1L grades. Uh, the interviews are at the end of 1L summer and the jobs, the, the plum jobs are mostly gone by 2L or 3L year. Uh, your final exam is 100% of your grade. It's, it's, it, it is what drives your grade. And your final exam depends on issue spotting ability. Um, so you have to nail it right away. You might fix 1L year if you had a bad first semester by getting all A's second semester. You can't recover. If you blow first year entirely, you can't recover and your professors won't help you get this right. So if you go to some sources like Reddit or top law schools, you'll see people say, hey, should I, what should I do to get ready for law school? And a bunch of people who, I don't know how else to put this, have nothing better to do than to kind of sound like know-it-alls on Reddit or top law schools say, don't do anything, do, don't do anything, just, just chill, there's nothing you can do. You'll hear it from current law students. You'll hear it from people who are entering law school. Uh, cranks like Hausman will say this, uh, or professors. You can totally prepare. I think all of this is bullshit. You can totally prepare. Preparing the right way is what helps. My best students, um, I've done individual tutoring for almost 10 years, and I've, I've run this online course for five. Uh, my absolute best students started the earliest. Uh, I have some really straight A students, um, both as one-on-one -on -one students and the people who kind of took my online course without me ever having talked to them, honestly. They just went through my online materials and got really close to straight A's, which are super rare in law school. Um, and I think, you know, if you ask them, clearly these students don't regret preparing ahead. Um, and I think um, if you prepared and you don't get the best grades, what can you do? You did your best. Um, but many people with crappy grades, you know, I can't say either way. Maybe uh, for the people who, who prepared and didn't end up doing well, um, I think there's something to knowing that you left everything on the field and at least you tried. I think the big tragedy is if you get crap grades and you just don't know, you didn't prepare, you didn't get on top of it, and maybe you could have done better, but you'll, you'll never know. So what do you need to prepare? Um, you need good advice that's actually worked for other students. You need good black letter law explanations. You need a detailed issue spotting strategy and tactics so that you know um, exactly what you're doing when you're taking an exam. And you need a system uh, to keep practicing. I mean, the one that I give you is Tapiad, which works whether you do this course or not. But wouldn't it be nice to actually have a structure that helps you um, take hypos? Um, so one thing I noticed over time is that students who write to me out of the blue, maybe not even knowing that I have a course, will say they want to kind of practice issue spotting, but they don't know enough law to do a hypo. So they just don't do them. They wait until they finish their outlines or they wait until the end of the semester. And the tragedy is they know that early issue spotting will help them a lot. But they're just stuck with this mental hurdle. It's like, I don't know enough law, so I won't do it. And then they procrastinate and they end up like everyone else, even those who didn't even think to prepare earlier. Um, so they didn't develop their issue spotting muscle. So perhaps not surprisingly, given I'm the one doing this, um, Kit Cools provides this. I give you good battle tested advice that has worked for other students and that will work for you. Um, I have black letter law explanations. I offer you my own outlines. 
Gilberts and Emanuels are great. You can use those. But I also spend a little more time unpacking things that are harder to understand. Um, do I provide you an issue spotting strategy and tactics? Yes, I have lots of lessons that go through how to analyze a legal problem, how to write it, uh, how to structure it down to the sentence level. And I offer you a system so that you can practice hypos um, without knowing the law ahead of time so that you can start right away. Um, while I offer general strategies, the heart of Kit Cools is to help you build your issue spotting, mu spotting muscles early up. Um, not only do I give you the law, but basically I kind of do what they call scaffolding. I start with easy problems so you can build up confidence and strength um, in, in taking the hypos. Um, so you can practice issue spotting earlier, maybe when you don't know the law, don't feel as comfortable knowing the law. Um, I'll just give you the law I want you to apply to different situations. Uh, that way you'll build up the issue analysis muscle faster and you'll learn to spot issues earlier. You will get up the learning curve faster. Everyone gets up the learning curve, but the people who get the A's are up the learning curve earlier and faster than, than other students. And the ultimate result is you will get better grades. So uh, I want to show you my course really briefly. Um, this is my website I've already logged in. Um, this is what Kit Cools looks like. Uh, there's uh, an overall syllabus with kind of general strategy lessons along the lines that I discussed with you earlier. Um, this kind of unpacks a lot of individual lessons. Um, and then I get into specific tips for CRIM uh, hypos and then kind of longer exams. But I want to show you what some of these look like. Um, you kind of drop in. And the hypos provide instructions on what I'd like you to do. It'll tell you the law. Sometimes I'll give you some exam tips. And then you'll have facts and a question. So this is where like Burr shoots Hamilton and they say things to each other and you kind of write your answer, submit it. Um, and then there are various mechanisms for feedback. Um, one is to kind of an issue checklist, like did you get, did you notice everything, at least that I noticed? And so you kind of do that and you go through and they're relatively detailed explanations. And then you can look at different answers. I'm trying to come up with a different format for this, but these are real student answers and kind of a quick, sometimes I give you what I think of them in a kind of more detailed analysis. But sometimes it's enough to know, and with the other hypos, I'm still building this part of it out, what a crappy, what an okay answer looks like, and what I think a better answer looks like. Um, And that's kind of one of the hypos. Um, I'd like to show you another one. Um, this is a little cleaner. Uh, some instructions some law, um, the facts and some kind of exam tips, um, the self-grading, 
kind of issue checklist to see what you missed and what you may not have. Um, again, actual good answers, okay answers, not so good answers, and then a bit of self-reflection so that we can kind of try to match up like not just in terms of the issues, but in terms of the style of writing, um, where you think uh, you are compared to the other essays that you've seen, and maybe thinking about why a lot of recent research says that this is part of deliberate practice, not just learning the right answers, but thinking carefully through um, um, why, uh, why something was good and why something wasn't, but taking the time to actually reflect on that. Um, so that's my course. I offer this for the kind of base version offers most of the 1L materials. Um, um, I'll put that shortly into uh, the sales page that will say more about what the course does. I will be offering a tier um, uh, that involves kind of more live lectures like this over the summer. Um, and, um, and during the year, uh, at least a couple times a month. Um, I haven't done that for a couple of years. Uh, I'm coming back to it now because I think there's demand for it. Um, but it wouldn't be the same as one-on-one. -on -one. I'm thinking about a way to do one-on-one -on -one to provide feedback on individual exams. If for the people who have the money, the one-on-one -on -one seem to be the most effective, many, many students have done well using my online course. It, um, they may try to find some way to provide limited feedback, even just it's like, this is great, this is not so great, without having to go into huge detail. It may steer a lot more students the right way with a little bit of individual attention. So, I'm gonna come back to, to this and then um, I'll just share with you a couple of emails I've gotten from students over the years. Um, here's one from someone, I, I, so this is an online, purely online student um, who I'd never spoken to. They just signed up for my course. I never talked to them and this person got straight A's and an A plus in torts and they were pretty confident that they uh, did well because of the course and helped them become this person, become a beast uh, at exam time. And um, he kind of re reiterated my advice that I said, don't worry about how other students were studying, not to waste time coming over every word in the case book. And this is natural. And this is why I started with this. This is a, sometimes, a psychologically a difficult strategy to maintain. You can feel like you're doing the wrong thing when everyone is doing something else. But um, you all are not repeat players. I've seen this market for 10 years and longer because I started to do basically drafting hypos and, and grading them for students in law school uh, 20 years ago now almost. Um, and I've seen this over and over again. The, the pull to follow all of the other uh, law students over the cliff like lemmings is very strong and you have to try to resist it. Whether you take my course or whether you just take my free advice, um, you have to resist it. So notice the guy's self-doubt. I did feel a little off behind students who could recite verse from our casebook. In short, I didn't feel as smart as the guy next to me who could quote a line from a certain page and then have a back and forth the professor. But hey, that guy can go kick rocks because your method is really what works in law school um, and the, the results show that. Um, I don't, I show some transcripts on, on, on my website's testimonials page, um, but this is a student who also, I didn't, this was not a one-on-one -on -one student, um, and she messed up legal writing, which I love, uh, but she made up for, for getting it an A plus in, in crim law. This is a first semester, someone who went to Northwestern. Um, I tell people not to work at hard at all at legal writing. It's not an important class. According to people who look at transcripts, they don't take it seriously. And yet it's a time suck, but that's a lesson that I've also put on YouTube. 
Um, this is a weirder email from a guy who wrote in. He was not a student of mine. He never bought kit cools. He said, I came across your service and use your free instruction to dramatically increase my performance to 392 this semester. It's a little late for me to be thinking of bid law. It's a little late for me to be thinking big law, but use this as testimonial value. It's my humble opinion that no incoming law student should do without the support you provide through kit cools. Even the second semester is too late to find one stride. I don't know that I agree with that. I have seen people recover second semester. I think too well is perhaps too late, um, but you have to figure it out and, and get it earlier than everybody else. So this, this, this is where you'll find the sales page. I will copy this um, and put it in the, uh, in the text. Um, you'll get a couple more emails, I think, reminders um, sorry, let's give me a second. I'll just type it directly into the chat. Um, so there's the link. Um, so uh, a couple of questions. Um, I'll try to answer as many as I can from the chat. Is this a subscription service or paying a tutor? It's, it's neither. The online course is self-directed. Um, and you can either pay up front or pay over the course of a year. Um, but it's not a membership that you can kind of cancel midway. I do have a, a 60 day, 100% uh, money back guarantee. But you know, once you're making the monthly payments, I, may, I set up a monthly payment program to make it more affordable. Um, uh, but it's not a subscription, so you get it. Um, but if you do the live one, now I, I haven't posted uh, the information for live. I'll make it available to Steve in another day or two. Live is what will give you access to uh, basically a kind of one week boot camp over the summer. I'll have a couple of discrete times to that that'll be available before school starts. And then kind of continuing access where you can call me. I'll have kind of regular office hours during the year a couple times a month and more closer to exam time um, where I'll answer direct questions. I can even do short snippets of hypo review um, over um, over um, over kind of a, a free Zoom, not free, but within the course uh, on a, a Zoom format like this. Um, when you think back, what was the connection between LSAT Law School and what you're offering at Larry Law Law? Um, that's, um, uh, I guess the, the thread that I would say that runs through all of that. Um, I think, you know, I think back to when I first, this was many years ago, became aware of Steve's website and the LSAT blog. <clears throat> I mean, he starts out by pointing out that he did not do super well on the LSAT the first time. It became his quest to learn how to master it. I think what Steve's experience teaches, I mean, he's, he's a brilliant guy uh, and um, the LSAT is uh, a studyable test. Um, and it's not necessarily one that you can just be good at from the beginning, even if you're as, as smart as Steve is. Um, I think law school is the same. Um, you, you know, there of course will be geniuses, but we don't build systems around geniuses who just get it right away. Law school is absolutely studyable if you put in the time and you do the right things. Um, you can do well. Um, is this offered around the same time each year? Um, I open, so 
Um, the course, I tend to open and close different times. I generally only open the course three to four times a year. Um, once in the spring, usually once in the summer, once when school starts. I don't like to open the course late in the semester because, um, you know, anyone can still benefit from the very concrete kind of exam taking tactics that I offer. Um, they're, they're totally helpful to people who um, haven't taken, um, don't know what they're doing on exams, but, um, but a lot of this is meant to prepare. I mean, it takes time to get good at this. So um, I offer them a couple times a year. Um, is it possible to upgrade later on? It is possible to upgrade later on. Um, uh, I, the, the, the live tier will be more expensive than, than the courses that I'm listing. It's, it's not going to be four digits, but it's going to be um, very close to it. But I think you get a lot out of it. But I'm, I'm going to post it. But you can make that decision later. Once you buy, you can always upgrade. That's, um, but, um, but you can't. Um, I'm, I'm not available year-round to buy. Part of it is I, I want to spend time not just selling um, and, and kind of uh, uh, doing seminars. I love helping people however I can, but I do want to focus on students that are, that are paying. And so, um, so I think that's that. I, um, I'm happy to answer any other questions, but um, I think I've been talking almost nonstop for two hours. Um, happy to take any other questions in the chat. And I'm sorry I wasn't able to unmute folks. I, I, um, you'd think that after all this time on Zoom, um, I'd have an easier time of it. But uh, So I'll answer a couple other questions that are here. Um, when you enter law school, you see people wearing business formal clothing while attending class. What's the importance of wearing business formal clothing? I honestly have not seen that. I mean, um, I think people just dress however they're comfortable. I think it's whatever makes you feel good, but it's, it's um, this is not very Asian Korean tiger parenty, but I mean, I think you gotta be who you are. I don't think you can be. You're, you know, law school is a lot more like high school in how, at least before COVID, you know, you're physically around the same people um, you're in a section, you might have be at a law school of 500, but you're just in a section of 100 people and you know those people really well. You just got to be who you are. So um, there's no one, I think, to impress with clothing. Um, in this sense, I think law school has a chance to be a touch more meritocratic than uh, other other things, because partly because the exam is graded blind and good ideas are just good ideas. Uh, that doesn't mean that there isn't sort of implicit bias by the professor, but it gives somewhat more of a chance to that. So what I think that enables um, students just to try to be who you are. I mean, it's kind of hard to not be who you are. How can we be sure exams are graded blindly? Can profs use their discretion in, in signing a grade? So yes. Uh, uh, how can we be sure? Um, there is exam software. And so numbers are not relayed. Names are not relayed. Um, you're not going to be doing in-class exams since because of COVID. But um, they're submitted anonymous, anonymously. I mean, I suppose. Um, uh, I suppose that, um, um, you know, professors could try to figure out who th things are, but they're bound not to, um, um, I've, I've not heard of it being a problem. They, um, now once they know, once they get the exams scores back, I think at that point, they use their discretion to bump up grades based on participation. But I've almost not heard of anybody in asking around benefit from that. Um, I mean, people are weird about their grades. It's hard enough to know why you got what you did. 
Um, let me see some other questions. What's the difference between Kick Cool's total and live? Uh, I think the sales page may not reflect this yet. Kick Cool's total will include two and three L materials and recordings of any live sessions. Live um, includes the boot camp uh, over the summer and access to me. You will actually get to ask me questions on office hours if you make use of them and have me, me even go over small snippets of exam problems if you want. Um, in total, you can be a passive consumer of recordings of those office hours during the year and you don't get the boot camp. Um, which is better to live in dorms? Uh, I don't know. Um, Apart from your exam, what did you do that impressed your professors? Um, if you want me to be honest, like, I don't think I seem like a shy person, but in class, like, I always felt like I kind of whiffed it. Like, I was not impressive in class. Um, so I don't know if I impressed them or not in class, which makes me almost certain that the exam grades that I got um, and, you know, were based on my writing and not because... I, I think I appear more relaxed and entertaining now, at least I hope I do. Um, it wasn't Flash that, that helped me get that. Um, do you have any recommendations for being a better writer, generally speaking? Um, get the Strunk in White and practice. I will say that exam writing is exam writing. Um, uh, whether I'm a fan or, or not, and I'm kind of not, uh, the late Justice Scalia had a perfect uh, thing that he said once where, you know, he, he's always been lauded on his, his kind of writing style. It tends to be engaging and it's acerbic, but he kind of dismissed it out of, out of hand. Some reporter asked him, like, how did you get to become such a good legal writer? And he said, legal writing is to writing, uh, this was his kind of SAT type analogy, legal writing is to writing as, as, military music is to music. Um, I have friends who got great grades who I don't necessarily consider to be great writers. I love great writing. Uh, it's, I, I, I live, you know, for a well, um, really well honed turn of phrase, but it's not necessary. Um, this, this is, um, you, by practicing hypos, you will get good at at this kind of legal writing. I wanna be super clear, exam writing is not the same as general legal writing. Those are two different skills. They are related and um, the kind of exam writing will sharpen your mind. Legal writing is, is hard and you know, you've got a legal writing course but it's basically only through practice. Um, But I need a laptop in law school or just an iPad. Um, I don't know. Uh, I, uh, I have an iPad Pro, which I've used to replace my computer. I think the world of it, it's faster than a lot of top of the line i7 um, Macs and PCs. Um, um, When you're cold called, how do you answer the professor's questions without looking at your notes? You just do the best that you can. I think um, it can be scary, but I mean, you just do the best that you can. Um, again, I, I don't, you know, you do the best that you can not over reading. Um, you don't have unlimited time. If you spend your um, precious time preparing to not look stupid in class, you are not spending your time preparing to actually get an A in the class. Um, and I think you, you listen to me and I'm this weirdo with a mustache and you're like, who is he? I'm, I'm the one who spends time trying to help students get better grades. My law professor friends, um, I love them, um, but they're not allowed to care about some students more than others. They have rough ideas but they don't tutor students to do better. So I wanna say this is natural. It's not like that they're, I, I would be the same if I were in their position. They're ego driven, like all of us are a little bit. They want P 
people to pay attention to them class. They want people to do the reading, so they're willing to scare people to do the reading uh, so they can have good in-class discussions. But that is not the kind of thing that will help you do well in law school. So uh, my advice to the person who's asked about cold calling, uh, you know, you have a couple of assumptions embedded in the question. How do you answer the professor's question without looking at your notes? Is it important to look good cold calling? Is it important to not look like you're looking at your notes? I don't think those are. I don't want to dismiss it's, it's terrifying to be humiliated in class, but it will pass. Your grades will not, and you have to keep that in mind. Is it better to work in groups or solo when studying for the final? Um, if you look on YouTube on Larry Lala, I have, I have study group advice, and my sense is generally um, uh, uh, sorry, uh, I should have spotlighted uh, earlier. Um, I think study groups are helpful, but you got to do the right things with the study groups. And I think that involves, um, especially when a TA or prof will not look at your exams, to, um, to trade exams and uh, critique, critique each other's exams and read each other's answers because your peers, you're crowdsourcing. They will spot issues that you didn't and you will spot issues that they didn't. Um, I want to make sure that I'm not... Um, um, some people work alone, I realize, and then you got to do what works for you. I did a study group. I found it super helpful. We all made law review. We, we all kind of got the jobs that we wanted. Um, uh, that might be survivorship bias. I can't, I can't say that this, you know, it's hard to say because I can't run a controlled study with a parallel universe me that didn't do a study group, but I, I think it helped. But you have to use it for the right thing. Some people like had these dysfunctional study groups. I don't know if you watch Community. It's one of my favorite shows. Don't be that. Um, uh, be friends, but when you get together as study groups, focus on a couple of narrow things. Uh, during the semester, it may be just discussing the bits of law that you did not understand and just um, creating each other's exams or trading outlines. Uh, in classes, you're preference sitting in the front or the back. Um, just sit where you want to. Some professors will assign seating. You don't have a choice wherever you feel more comfortable. I think some of these, I, I want to say like some of these questions um, focus on the kind of broader big wins. Law, uh, law school is not about these kind of smaller things. Um, if it helps you sit in front uh, but otherwise, make sure that you're sweating the big things properly, and then you can worry about the small things, okay? Um, I'm going to give it one or two more questions. Um, and then... Um, uh, how come you stopped practicing law? Uh, I haven't. I just... Uh, I don't work for a law firm anymore, and I don't work for the CAA. I, I just I can't talk about my employment, but clearly it's for it's for the government. Um, how many hours per week does your program require time investment? If you're in the summer and you're not working, uh, try to spend as much time as you can. That's not helpful, but I think three to five hours a week. Uh, if you mix kind of going through passive um, lessons and then actively um, reviewing, um, actively doing practice hypos should be good. Um, what was the best part of law school? Uh, I might be weird, but I just liked law school. Maybe it's why I'm doing this. Um, I really loved, um, I had applied for and got into and didn't do some PhD programs in international relations. But um, I have kind of 
introspective tendencies and yet I really love the other people in law school like um, they're still some of my best friends I write and talk to some of them still in some way every day um, at NYU I at the time felt it was the best international law program maybe in the world um, and it drew LL fantastic foreign law students, LLMs from around the world. And when I go to other countries, I visit them, went to London for a family vacation and saw my barrister friend, um, uh, Amal Clooney, here I, in a name drop, is, I she doesn't, probably doesn't remember me, but she was, she was there my first year. Um, she clearly didn't belong looks wise. Um, uh, but she's the real deal. I had lunch with her 15 years ago with her and a bunch of other uh, foreign students. And um, she worked at the International Court of Justice. She was a really big deal, I think, in the international law community before George Clooney found her. Um, so the people, and I really, I loved class. I loved the international law courses that I took. Um, so how many hours should you spend studying each day? Um, I don't have a number for that. I think the question is what amount of time should you dedicate to the important activities? I think an hour a day devoted just to exam taking, issue spotting practice, uh, and then after that, side studying the law, pre-studying the law with outlines and just reading the cases the night before once so that you've done it um work backwards from there i don't have a fixed amount but you need to sleep you need to sleep eight hours a night so that you're not damaging your brain um and this includes getting to exam time again to have the fullest creative flow you need to have full night sleep best you can where do you get issue spotting practice um uh, my course is one. It's the most organized way I know of to get actual issue spotting practice. There are some websites um, and they're getting fewer and fewer by the day. And I will eventually link to them on the free part of my website at LarryLawLaw.com um, where you have existing um, exams, um, past exams that some professors are willing to offer. But if I remember right, University of Kentucky, Berkeley used to offer it and they took them offline and now they're only available to Berkeley law students. Um, but I can try to, to post it. Um, I, I create a lot of the hypos based on experience. Um, and so Kit Cools offers a lot of that. Uh, I once heard a law student say you only have time for one extra thing during law school example exercise. Is this true? Don't follow my example, but um, uh, I pre-studied the law. I started to take practice exams earlier than others. I exercised three times a week. Um, I swam a couple, I was a swimmer in, in high school, I swam a couple days a week and I played water polo on Friday nights. There was a club at NYU. It's how I met my now wife. I started dating her then. We spent a lot of time together. Um, I actually started a nonprofit that was a terrible time to do it and it just kind of fell apart. So, um, uh, don't do that. <laughs> uh, I did very well first year, but I think um, uh, part of that was luck. Um, and I did get the spare grade that I didn't like my first year. Um, so you have time, to, uh, but let me back up. I think you have time to sleep. You can make time to sleep. You have make time to exercise and you have make time to socialize like you, you don't don't especially if you have kind of introverted tendencies like find a couple of people that you're comfortable with and and make it a group thing that you go through um uh if you are only doing loss if you're reading cases 
from dawn till dusk, uh, I, I think you're not, um, if you're, it's possible to spend that time just doing the wrong things. You can totally spin your wheels and plenty of people do. If you're focusing on the right things um, and you do that from dawn to dusk, then you should be the best student in your class. Um, but uh, I think you have more, you have time to do more than one thing than exercise and sleep. I, I think, and I think it's, um, you know, my first year, Larry Kramer, who eventually became the dean at Stanford, and I think he moved on to some other jobs since then, uh, when he was at NYU, said, you should immerse yourselves and don't do anything else. I don't disagree. I wouldn't do dumb extracurriculars, as I said. Um, you should immerse yourself. You should do the right things, follow the kind of study patterns that I've mentioned. Um, but exercise and socialize, you got to get to know other people. Um, and the best networking is sincere, natural networking, just to get to know people. Um, you're not creating connections, you're creating sincere friendships. And then later on, someone will remember you. You'll, if, if, if you were friendly and a good person, they'll remember you. It's like, ah, I guess he's doing that. I could throw him some business. Um, where can I get a good available vocabulary LSAT resource? I, I don't do LSAT, so I'm not going to be that helpful with that. I have not, I haven't heard much about Harvard's uh, zero L course. I, I don't have thoughts on that. If you ping me individually, Larry at LarryLala.com, I can try to find out and get back to you. What happens if you can't make friends in law school? Any tips? Um, everyone needs friends, I think. Um, and there are plenty of people who are also, I think one of the biggest things to remember is that it's not like you're going to a place where everyone feels comfortable and feel like they belong there. Everyone, however smart they are, uh, some people will like seem more assertive and cool, but everyone uh, is a little bit shy and wants to make friends. So I think it's just getting out of yourself enough to realize that other people feel that way. And if you take the first step uh, to make a friendship, then it'll be reciprocated. The summer boot camp, um, it's rolling through the summer. I'll have different dates, but it's going to be like a week long boot camp where you do some coursework by yourself. There'll be a live component for an hour or two every day and then homework again. Um, if I were to start law school with kids, would I have done well the first year? I guess it depends on how old the kids are. I think my kids are um, 10 and eight now. Sorry, I had to think about that. Um, 10 and a half, eight and a half now. Um, if they were that age, maybe. I think very young children are hard. Um, uh, I think that's the best I can tell you for the person who asked, asked that. Okay, any last questions? I'm really gonna close this up. Um, I think Steve has posted about that woman who, uh, it's a single mom with like five kids or something who just graduated from law school. But anyway, um, Thank you all. Um, I'd urge you to buy my course. One way or the other though, please try to remember some of the tips uh, that I provided. I'd really like to see you do well in law school and um, hopefully see you on the flip side um, in Kit Cools and Kit Cools Live. Thanks guys. Um, I've, uh, I'm going to actually end in the course, so I'm going to kick everyone out. Thank you, guys. Thanks for tuning into the show. Please subscribe if you haven't done so already to be notified of new episodes as I release them. And feel free to reach out if you need anything at all as you move forward with your prep. I'm happy to help however I can. In the meantime, I wish you all the best and take care.